All right. Yes. Um, thanks all. Sorry for the late meeting. Uh, we had a, another forum that ran over. Um, call to order the Rooks for the Montpelier Roxbury uh, Board of School Commissioners at, sorry, I need the time. 652. Uh, so first order is public comment, um, which is five minutes. So is there... um, So I'm Elaine Dewey. Okay. And um, please either come to the microphone or the chair and you just announce yourself, but please announce yourself again. This is, this is You're not going to be louder. It's yes. just for the video camera. Um, yeah. So I'm Elaine Dewey. I'm a parent of a student, current student, and I have two other students um, who will be coming up through. Um, one's two, so not for a while. And um, I'm just here to kind of give some input about health education that my kids reflected back to me. Um, and I guess that education, that, that piece is that I would like to see that be more inclusive of all students. Um, and I guess the big pieces with that that have come up are um, uh, being able to redirect conversations and being really kind of educated on some subjects that are um, difficult or even triggering or traumatizing. Um, and having some outside people maybe come in and talk on those specific topics. Um, and yeah, I think that's the biggest piece. Um, my child is transgender, so uh, there were things that happened last year that he actually is not in health class now, and a correspondence class to cover um, his health education is not acceptable. Um, the, the class needs to actually be, um, and the curriculum needs to be set up in a way where my child's included, so, and all children are included in that curriculum. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, I'm Mara Iverson. I also live in Montpelier, and I also wanted to chat about health education. My focus is mainly um, that sex education in the Montpelier School District really needs a lot of kind of, a lot of things. It could use um, some review, it could use some thinking about whether more educators are necessary, whether they're trained um, to offer appropriate information. I actually mostly, the first time I got worried about it was when I had a student, I teach sex ed in, in town um, at the church, I teach the OWL program, and one of my students who had been through my program came and said, the health teacher today told us that non-latex non condoms don't prevent um, pregnancy and STIs. Like, and I was like, well then what would be the point of wearing one if it didn't prevent pregnancy and STIs? And so I was like, what are you learning at school if that seemed concerning to me? So that's my, um, I'd really be interested in um, having a deeper conversation about what we could do to enhance, broaden, deepen sex education in Montpelier School District. Thanks. Great, thank you both. Thank you both. Yeah, we are going to continue discussions about that. Is, is there a timeline or a one? Or a uh, it will certainly appear on the agenda. We haven't set any timeline. Um, I think we're likely going to do it in the, uh, yeah, in in the guise of making sure we promote equity on a, you know, a gender and and uh, you know, basis and. Mm -hmm. Did you figure out how to find the agenda? Um, we did. We figured out that cell phones don't access all of your agendas. So Ooh. that um, That's good to know. That is good to know. We both have access to different information, and neither of us have access to all of it. Huh. huh. OK. Huh. Well, that's a bug. Yeah. <laughs> Let's we'll, fix we'll, that. We'll figure that out. We'll look into that. It's all, yeah, it's all accessible through Google Drive, right? I'd have to look. Is that, isn't that where everything is? Is, is that where you want? Like, no, you're on your website, is, and um, yes. you, can't, yeah. you can't scroll over to the board packets on mine, so I didn't know there were board packets. Uh -huh. And then on hers, you can see the board packets, but they stop at December. I can see all the way to the end of the year. I just can't see all the way over. So huh. it's really interesting. Yeah. Thank you for letting us know that. It's better than when you couldn't even get anything on your iPad. <laughs> We've improved still a little problem. bit. Still a problem. Who's this guy? <laughs> I'm not sworn in. Still, you haven't sworn still? in yet? We're still in public comment, though. I thought about it before this happened. <laughs> you can do it by phone, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And I think you're supposed to do it before your term's up. 
Uh, uh, consent agenda. Okay, and uh, yeah, thanks for the reminder. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the learning focus piece, um, which is a big part of our agenda, um, the students were unable to come tonight. There were some things that popped up, so we have a much shorter agenda, which since we're starting late, um, is uh, not the worst thing in the world. We're talking about that. Is Renee on call if we need her earlier? Yeah, I can, I can check. Okay. Is okay. she here? No. She's going to she's gonna, um, Google chat in, but if she's, I think it's just be told to age she might. I move to accept the consent agenda. Okay. Second. Any? Um, I, have a, I have a quick question. Oh my God, I'm sorry. This is. Well, the question is so you can get it on your phone, but maybe we just need more clear navigational instructions. Okay. So, did that have to do with the consent agenda? Yeah. Could be yeah. Apple Could I, be operating I, I, systems. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, but it, to, to address that, I, I noticed that it, it wouldn't scroll up. Anyways, it doesn't matter. Okay. It can be dealt with outside this. I do have a question about the. Consent agenda. agenda. It was something related to the superintendent's report, which is the unified basketball team. Okay, so do you want to remove that from the? Yes. Okay. okay. So let's make a motion to just do to I ask, remove just something. Ask a question, or we don't even need to remove it. If, if we can approve it, and I just would like to ask the question afterwards. Yeah, that's fine. Right. Can we have a discussion after the motion is approved to accept the consent agenda. There's so we, we can discuss after. So. After we approve. Yeah. It's, it's, okay. After you make the motion. Right. After you make the motion to accept. Is there any more discussion? And then after okay. the discussion is over, we would accept. Even for consent agenda? No, you couldn't do that. The whole point was you can't discuss it. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's, let's just pull that and approve without that <laughs> item, and then we'll discuss it. I amend my motion. See the, that Heather sent out the, a different distribution list this afternoon, just adding yes. Roxbury Village School. Yeah. Yep. So I amend my motion to say that. Um, <laughs> Um, I'd like to make a motion to approve the consent agenda, taking out the superintendent's report and noting that the list of where agendas and warnings are are different than was in the packet. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Your question. This, this will be very brief. Um, the unified basketball. Yeah. Is that uh, Montpelier and U32? Is that a combined sports team? We have some students from U32 on that team. Yes. Okay. Matt McLean's son Noah is on it, as well as um, Carolyn Canary's daughter is on it. Um, so, yeah, we often share things with U32 when, when they don't offer. So, or we don't offer. So, that's great because that kind of dovetails into my question. If it doesn't need to be addressed for next time, maybe this summer it, it can be addressed. But a question that I've received numerous questions about, well, how are we sharing resources with U32? Are we, are we operating in silos? Do we, sh do we share? Are there opportunities to leverage economies of scale and offer enhanced programming? And, and I know we are doing that in some Yeah, places. the quick answer is yes. So when U32, I'm sorry if I cut you off. No, U32 I, offers something that we don't, for instance, football, then Montpelier students can try out for that team. Um, and when Montpelier offers something that U32 doesn't debate, um, then U32 students can join us. How about with academic programming? We don't have as much sharing going on with academic programming. So I, I guess a question, and I don't know how difficult. Had, but the schedules don't. Yeah, it's hard. It okay. gets a little more difficult when you're talking about classes, in house classes. So it's primarily for extracurriculars? Yes. Where we're, yes. We're seeing this. Would, would it be possible at some point to just get a, a, an outline of where we are sharing those resources? Is that something yeah. that would be onerous? No. Because okay. that would just, I think, help inform the discussion about this because it's something that regularly comes up. But thanks. Like I said, it wasn't going to impact my vote on this. So <laughs> should I make a motion to approve the superintendent's report? Yes. I'll second or, that. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Great. I can also say, well, just the last little bit, the final, um, Heather, you know this, the final unified basketball game is 
next Tuesday the 11th at 3.30. It's a great time to come and cheer on the kids. So Thursday. So if anybody can come, then please come on over. I'll take a picture and tweet it up. <laughs> yeah, but it's a great, it's a good time. It's a good time. Great. Um, so next is uh, board business. The first um, item when we put our uh, merger agreement together, there was a typo of a couple of digits on a statutory reference. Um, and a cut and paste job did not get removed. So the, um, the articles of merger between Roxbury and Montpelier reference a statute that does not exist. Um, and were the specifics in the packet? I don't remember. Yeah, I had yeah, the other one out there. She just printed out the emails okay. with it. Yeah. Um, so, uh, this should, so we talked to PHR, he said the simplest way to kind of cross the I's and dot the T's on this was just to have the board um, recognize and approve that that was a typographical error and um, that there's a correction to that error. It was like and section yeah. 55 and it was Truly printed as only, like section 5536. Right, the only um, <laughs> change for the public is that it's just a number that it's was incorrect. Number. So yeah, exactly. they're not changing any substance, just you're just changing the number to reflect the actual number. Exactly. It is it is a cut and paste mistake. Jim, who found the cut and paste mistake? Uh, Steve, Steve Dale, Dale, who was the right. uh, he was just oh, going Jim back Dale. and reading <laughs> the just, old. He was going just just for fun. You know? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he says it has been brought to my attention. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know who brought, brought it to his, his attention. attention. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Curious. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think I could have been someone at DSBA or um, you know, maybe he had a family member that was having some problems sleeping and decided yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to read the merger yeah. agreement again. <laughs> uh, so um, if we get have a vote on uh, making that change. So we need a motion. We need a motion. Um, That's what I meant to say. Do we need a motion that's this whole thing that Steve said? At the bottom? I mean, I'll read that if that's what we need to do. Um, sure. It, it it's just kind of long. Yeah. All right, I will move that as follows. So, anyway. The articles of agreement were approved by the electorate of the Montpelier Roxbury Public Schools in spring 2017. In March 2019, we were informed of a typographical error in Article 11. The original approved article specified that in the new district, the vote on the quote, annual budget and public questions shall be conducted by Australian ballot pursuant to 17 VSA chapter 5513B, close quote. <coughs> there is no chapter 5513B. The intent of that wording was to simply read pursuant to 17 VSA chapter 55. That typo is hereby corrected by vote of the Montpelier Roxbury School District Board. Article 11 is modified to read the Unified District Board of School Directors shall propose annual budgets in accordance with 16 VSA Chapter 11. The vote on the annual budget and public questions shall be conducted by Australian ballot pursuant to 17 VSA Chapter 55. I'll second. All those in favor? Or any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Mm -hmm. Great. We've done that. Um, Next item is after school discussion. I'll just uh, can, open can it. I just ask, who's going to actually do it? I mean, someone has to actually do this now, right? Is that even Where is it filed? I don't know. We just thought I'd throw that out there. Good idea. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry. That's a good question. Um, who do we inform? Like we could take the minutes Steve, the I would imagine and staple the person who did this. Yeah, yeah. yeah or you just do that. Steve would, know, <laughs> Steve would yeah. know where to go with it. Right. Yeah. All right. So where is this kept? Who's the keeper of this? That's what we don't happen to know right yeah. now. I'm I'm assuming maybe the agency the of education. Yeah, yeah the district clerk. probably have to send it to. Oh right, the district clerk. The district clerk. That's right. Oh, that's probably the person. So and the legacy. Yep. Yeah. Well. She has 
So after school discussion, um, we've had uh, quite a bit of progress on, on making a decision about uh, what the after school programming will be uh, next year, basically on the provider. Uh, as you know, back in, was it December? No, January. Back in January, we tax, 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 tasked and um, uh, appointed a committee to uh, set up an RFP process where we would take in bids uh, and that the committee would work with uh, Libby on advising her about a decision. Um, that committee has been formed. I want to thank all the members, including Bridget, uh, but also we have a couple community members, Christine Zaki, uh, Rebecca Copans, um, Cassie Wilner, uh, Sam Brondike, who's a student representative, and then uh, uh, Ryan Harity, uh, the principal of UES, and Matt Roy, uh, the vice principal at MSMS, have also participated in the committee. Uh, we've received, we, yeah, the committee worked to set out some parameters, uh, put together the RFP. Uh, we sent it out, we received four proposals, um, one from CC, which is the existing provider, uh, and is an entity of uh, Washington Central Supervisor <coughs> Union. Uh, one from the After School Collaborative, uh, which is doing business known as Part Two, uh, which is a for-profit provider uh, that uh, provides uh, after school services for a lot of schools in Chipman County. Uh, that's looking to expand into Washington County. Uh, the Y, uh, which actually does programming nationally, but they have a pretty vigorous uh, uh, program in Vermont, uh, and they provide throughout the state, uh, including to our neighbors in Waterbury and uh, Barrie, uh, and the Montpelier Rec Department. Uh, I th we passed out, we're weighing costs, we're weighing you know, capacity, we're weighing kind of all the factors that we put together. Uh, but a piece I want to talk about, or I want me to talk about in addition to um, you know, the proposals is as we make a decision, uh, there's kind of two components to after school care. There's the license component, um, which is regulated by the state, uh, which most of the UES programming falls into. Uh, as you start to get to the older grades, uh, we have a lot more what we call enrichment programming, um, which is somewhat like co-curricular, but, but a little different. It's the more, you know, segment programming uh, that oftentimes focuses on an activity, you know, mountain biking, uh, a sport, uh, woodworking, et cetera, uh, that's not licensed. Um, that uh, programming right now, a lot of that programming is provided by the current provider uh, and funded through a combination of fees, uh, subsidy from the district, and then revenue that's generated from the license programming, particularly at Union Elementary School. Um, that's a critical piece of our after school care. We did not ask for the RFPs to include that. We asked for the RFPs only to include the licensed portion. Uh, three of the RFPs only included the licensed portion. One of the RFPs also included the non-licensed after school portion. So we're trying to, the committee's trying to consider it with that in mind. Um, but what we want to do with the non-licensed enrichment program, we obviously want that to continue. It's very popular. It, it does great things for kids. Uh, we want to continue along the value lines that it currently exists um, and with as much continuity as possible. But we also uh, want to think about chances to really expand and stabilize that um, and also fix some, some issues we've had. For instance, there's just been some issues with uh, transportation and doing that legally in a way that that meets demand um, so one one consideration that has that we've been batting around uh, is bringing um, that piece in district um, and that would require uh, a commitment of current funds and probably some additional funds to do that uh, to make that sustainable but there's also there's a lot of advantages to that and I'll let Libby kind of explain 
Sure, we're in, a bear, we're in the beginning stages of this, and I have something that was not part of your board packet, and I apologize for that. Um, I was getting feedback up until <coughs> 3 o'clock today. <coughs> so, I don't know who would do that. <laughs> from some members of the after school committee, and I wanted to make sure I heard from people. And so this is, this is very much draft. Okay, so, so put that in mind. The district, we have budgeted, and it has passed because our budget passed, um, $37,000 towards um, some sort of after school piece. Uh, so what this proposal, this draft proposal, um, is putting out there, let me just do this one, um, is that um, we hire a new position. So we hire a position for a .5, right, currently, that's what we're thinking the need is from leadership team, a .5 um, extended day enrichment coordinator. That person would re be responsible for organization, logistics, parent registration, um, collecting fees, working with our business office to making it happen. It would be very similar to food services. Sorry, I don't want to put my back How food services is run currently, which is run, it, run as an enterprise. Um, so we would we would add an additional enterprise, and I'm actually happy Grant is not in the room because he starts to choke up a little bit when I suggest that. But because for him at his end it's a little difficult, but we can do that. We already have it in place with food services. Um, so that position would be collecting the funds. They'd be out going out in the community to find community partnerships, surveying students to find out what their their likes and dislikes and what they really want um, for club like activities. We would also be looking at, oh, so there's that position. So let's, I'll separate that first. That's what I'm proposing for the board. I believe that the $37,000 would cover a .5 position under the AFSCME contract. Um, if you we're also looking at these club activities being, um, we'd ask parents to contribute as they do now um, in a very low cost way. So that cost would also help provide sustainability to that position, as well as increase our capacity over time. So one of the pieces that we really are looking at is to have licensed engaging, licensed engaged childcare from K through six offered to our students, and then starting in, with lots of engaging activities as part of that process. So they're not just sitting there doing coloring pages, right? Provided so by someone else. Contracted out, yes. yes. Contracted by somebody else, they would be responsible through our through work with our principals in our community around what engaging club like activities those that would require. Then when students move into seventh grade, they move into more enrichment extended day, not licensed choice activities that we offer multiple, um, very similar to what we have now, except it's sustainable more sustainable because it'd be a, through a district lens. We'd be able to protect it um, and to move forward with increasing our capacity. We see that at the leadership team level as a potential possibility to transition students well between eighth and ninth grade and provide a bridge in a very fun, easy way, um, as well as increase our capacity for, for opportunities that are not sports, drama, or music related here at the high school necessarily. We have excellent opportunities for kids if they're into sports and drama and music. Um, if you're not into those three things, then we have less opportunity here at the high school. Um, we're also very cognizant. I've been talking to Dave Bennett quite a bit, who is a person who's been doing this work at the high school. Um, we're, both he and I are very concerned with overscheduled, highly, um, highly involved kids. Um, and so providing opportunities to let go of some of that and, and work with anxiety, which is huge. Um, with our overscheduled, highly functioning kids, <laughs> um, as well as provide opportunities for kids who just don't aren't into sports and aren't into drama, um, but still want to have a group to to work on leadership skills and develop themselves and working with people without a screen in their face. Um, so Dave and I are, are have been talking quite a bit about that, um, and I also feel as Renee comes on in a little bit, that's an excellent project for a new principal to take on here at the high school to help vision and build that program. So back to the position is key because it allows us to um, sustain, build, and grow from where we are now. Questions, Andrew, how is that money currently being used? Currently it is given to CC to offset the cost at MSMS. And Tina. 
would um, would the theory be that I understand what this person's going to do, and then the activities themselves are self-supporting through parent revenue, right? Through and, and, a fee, and uh, yeah. Okay. Yes. So, so the vision is not that the person hired to be the coordinator would be the person providing. No. In fact, we wouldn't want them to provide the services. We want them to focus on the logistical piece so the people who do provide services can really focus on that and develop high quality programming. Would, would that increase the cost to students who are using the program? I don't, env I don't envision that happening. We haven't, we haven't gone through like cost structure and people, we haven't, we're not at that stage yet. Um, we're, we're just not there yet, but, but I don't envision that happening. But the disbursement to CC, it wasn't that direct as this is going to offset the cost to our students by this percentage. Is no, that correct? we don't have that information. It just went to a, a general fund at Washington Central. We sent a check to Washington Central in $18,000 increments twice a year. So we don't, so Andrew, because I, I know you're going to ask, <laughs> when I look at budget sheets from, from the current Community Connections program, I can't tell where that money goes. Mm -hmm. It goes into Washington Central's pot. Yeah. My, my overarching concern in asking that question is that I think an after school program is in the community and public good. And while, and, and I think the idea of a hybrid payment model, what we have right now, fees for those who use it, but those fees being brought down by contributions from the community, I think is a pretty healthy model. Mm -hmm. um, and I just want to ensure that uh, we continue with that yeah. general model and aren't putting too many too much of the cost and too much of that financial burden on those families right. and the resources. Right. No, I agree with you. But, and that's the that's where we want to go as well. That's that's the idea that we want to make happen. Michelle. Um so it says under the um you you just explained that the half time person would be a sort of an administrative position rather than a um not working directly with kids. And it says under here, recruit club advisors would be one of their responsibilities. Are we anticipating that the revenue from program fees is enough to pay the club advisors? I think, so that's the piece that we have to think about with cost structure. So we're not there yet. And so there's, there's lots of questions there, right? There, it's not a co-curricular because it's right. not structured in the same way. I'm, I'm imagining six weeks programming one day a week. You know, very similar to what's happening now. Mm -hmm. um, so that doesn't fall under our co-curricular teacher contract. Uh, so we want to look at how, how much do we need to, like that would be a new, new world for us. How much do we pay people for an hour and a half a week after school um, to do woodworking? Yeah. Um, and if they're a community member, what does that look like? Versus if they're a teacher, what does that look like? Those are still questions that we need to uncover, which thus the position to help us <laughs> to help us work through those those pieces. But but generally speaking, that's what you're anticipating that yes. the program fees would pay. The program fees plus the budgeted amount would help pay for fee things. Okay. Eventually, um, if we increase our capacity, which I would really like to do, mm -hmm. I may be coming to the board in future budgeting years saying, let's increase this line. Yeah. Um, so that we can access more kids, so that right. we can tar intentionally target more kids with this programming. So I definitely want to see more kids get in the program, um, and I'm okay with supporting it with the budget, but I, you had told us back at the beginning of this conversation um, in the winter that it was unusual for our community to budget funds for after school because we're not legally obligated school. to provide anything right after three o'clock for middle school yes you're right so um but we had asked that question of the vermont after school <coughs> association did we get any further information from them as to whether there are other districts that subsidize do we ask for that specifically uh i've talked to we can ask it more specifically my understanding is there are some districts that do some sort of we don't really know the answer to that. No. We don't really know the answer to that. I, like, for instance, she has mentioned that South Burlington does a lot of stuff in district that is traditionally covered, or that other schools tend to cover through. through I mean, contracts. that 
I and think and the piece of separating the extended day and the yeah. licensed childcare, I'm not sure what districts do with that right. piece. I nice mean, we do, pay, we do pay co-curricular stipends for sports coaches and um, that kind of thing. Maybe just sports coaches, I don't know. Yeah, we do with drama and yeah. we do with lots of things. Mm -hmm. When we were having this discussion initially, um, and you'd be more familiar with this mechanism than I am, Libby, but uh, we learned that uh, many other schools that have a certain percentage of free and reduced lunch students are eligible for federal funding. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and we're not because right. we don't have that percentage. Uh, so my, my perspective on this is because we're not, those, those students that do come from a disadvantaged socioeconomic background shouldn't be penalized as a result for having a lesser We're living in a more wealthier of, place. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, Good point, Andrew. And so that's where I do see a role for, for the board and um, being a leader on this type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Steve and then Bridget. I just have two clarifying questions. I, I have to admit to not understanding some of the structures. So you, you kind of draw the line, or maybe all of it is, between sixth and seventh in terms of where that goes. I know that, at least from my daughter's experience in fifth and sixth, is that Drew's been the contact for fifth and sixth and that she's been participating in mountain biking and all the same things, I think, as the older kid. I might be wrong about that. But, um, you know, and we're looking, you know, wood, wood shop and all the other things. So does that mean in the future, fifth and sixth, I, I'm not, I realize it's all being run under CC right now, but what's the decision or what's the reasoning for cutting it at yeah. sixth? And then the other piece is that, I, Michelle just started mentioning a little bit, or, but the co-curricular versus the enrichment, they seem to be a really similar thing. And I'm wondering if it makes more sense for the district to Adopt these things as co-curricular at seventh We've grade, about that. rather than as enrichment. Um, and I think that from a curriculum or from a whole child perspective, that actually brings in integrates things a lot better than if we continue to consider it separate. Just, so just let me, questions. No, those are really. Thanks for asking both those questions. Don't let me forget the latter one because I as we've talked about we've talked about both of these things. So one of the things that came up, Matt Roy actually. Um, brought this to our attention in the, when we were talking about this in the after school advisory committee because um, we talked about originally the district could, could potentially take on the enrichment and make it middle school fifth grade on um, and Matt brought up the really good point um, of currently and he worries about in the future of a have and have not scenario so um, if you're a kid who is in fifth grade and is in licensed childcare and not doing the mountain biking piece, he could he could potentially, as, a, as an expert in, at that age level, <laughs> see kids saying, "Well, I'm going mountain biking. You're stuck in the you're stuck in the over here doing whatever you're doing over here." Um, and so he was very concerned about about people who have things like would be considered the enrichment kids, and people who don't have things would be the licensed child care kids. Um, so that was very concerning to him, uh, which I thought was a very good point. I'm not saying it as eloquently as he did in the meeting. Um, and so when we started talking about that more, Matt and I started talking about that more, we started saying, well, if we make the assumption that we really work with a, our licensed child care provider to provide engaging opportunities for our fifth and sixth grade that have a club, -like, a club structure to them where there's choice and, and that kind of thing, um, so, but it's still within the licensed child care. We could have that piece. And then seventh and eighth grade, generally, we don't suspect that many seventh and eighth graders will participate in the licensed child care because they're at the age where they may not need it. They may not need that, that space like a fifth grader might. Um, so then we could offer the enrichment activities for those who would really like to participate in very specific choice activities for the seventh and eighth grade. That, nothing's set in stone around that. That was our reasoning why. So that when I was talking to Matt, that was the reasoning why for that. The stipe or the um, I'm sorry, the second part of your question around co-curriculars. Co um, we've talked about that too as a leadership team <clears throat> on Tuesday, and one some of the things that we were talking about is we could totally go that direction, and we talked about going that direction. We have way more flexibility if we don't, because once you have the co-curricular in place, then it's in place and and you can't add them ad nauseum. 
Um, it just it you, so if we had like quick six week bursts, that means we can change the program by year. Like that one didn't go last year. Let's try something else this year, and we can find a community member comes in and says, "Hey, I want to do a six week thing on oil painting." All of a sudden, we can quickly make that happen. Whereas a co-curricular, we go through a contract, we find a person, we, you know, it becomes a much more um, long process. Uh, for, so that's why the leadership team said, no, let's keep it as like very quick bursts of club activities. We could do, we could go either way though. Can, can I just ask the clarifying question? Sure. I, does, does the term co-curricular mean, is, is the definition of that, that someone on our faculty is the advisor yes. under the contract and gets paid? Not necessarily somebody on our faculty, but it's <coughs> part of our teacher contract. So and it is a contract. So the definition isn't really that it's this kind of programming versus that kind of programming. It's really there's some de there's some very specific definitions in the contract. So then there's there's levels of payment in there. So like if it meets once a week for um, for a semester, that's different than if it's a full year with multiple planning up planning responsibilities versus, you know, so it's, it's just different. It's just different. There's, it's a contracted item. With it's more rules. Ahead, Tina. More just rules and less flexibility. I'm curious to know if this 0.5 person, or if you've talked about this, is this person also in charge of hiring the people that would run this program and supervising the people that would run this program? Supervision would come from the, it would be a district responsibility, so the supervision would they would be the monitor for that piece? Um, they would be in charge of the, the hiring and the and getting. The, I mean, it would go through me eventually, but but they would be the ones finding. Yes, I would envision that to happen. Okay. Other questions, comments? Uh, so, um, to follow up on the point that Steve was making about age. I would have said that my sense was that um, in terms of the current enrichment programming at, at MSMS that a lot of younger kids are using it and that this structure may be, may be a loss in that regard because I, as hopeful as I am about the license program being a great program, I'm not sure just because of the transportation issues that the license program is likely to be doing. They would, be, but they would be more limited to, to site base until, exactly. until they solve the transportation dilemma. Yeah. Right, and that's a, and that's a problem. Um, I'm not sure that that, I mean, I, I think we've also discussed in the committee the possibility that the license program can wrap with enrichment, yeah. you know, so that you can you be can enrolled in the license program, but still yeah. able to, you know, on some days do other things if you're also yeah. doing the enrichment program. Um, and I think especially for sixth grade, you know, when we moved the fifth grade there, I'm not sure that the process, the thought about after school care was totally thought through. And I think the fifth grade really needs after school License. care, yeah. similar to what they used to have when they were at Union and, and the yeah. fifth graders went to that program yeah. until they moved. But as the kids get older, I think that the appeal of these um, activities becomes greater. What's um, interesting is one comment from the online piece, which I know only Jim and I have access to at the moment, but um, from the online uh, feedback, one, one individual in the community um, said that the enrichment opportunities at Main Street are overwhelmed with fifth and sixth graders, so seventh and eighth graders often don't get an opportunity. <laughs> they get left out of that, so it's, it's interesting. Well, because there's a more of a child care need for fifth yeah. and sixth graders, yeah. so uh, you know, there's more pressure from parents mm -hmm. to get kids enrolled when they're younger. Yeah. Sometimes, yeah. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, but it's de like I said, this is a draft. It's not set in stone, and I am very much looking for feedback to see how we can make this bigger or how we can make this better and um, keeping Matt's concern and I think the concern about haves and have nots is a, is a legit one. So how, if we were to bring it down to lower grade levels, how do we ensure that that's not a, that doesn't happen? I have one question following up on Steve's uh, question about the co-curricular approach. I, first of all, I can totally understand and appreciate wanting to use a less bureaucratic approach that will enable us to deliver uh, services quicker to kids that want those services. I think that's great. Offer better programming sooner. Uh, what would be the advantage of a co-curricular versus the, the approach that you were talking about? It'd be set. <coughs> Families could rely on it, could know that 
there there will be woodworking offered every fall by Jason. You know, <laughs> um, so it would be it's something that people could rely on a little bit more. Um, honestly, I see more limits to that direction than I see benefits. I'd have to, I'd have to really think through. I'd have to think through a little bit more. The one that chop, jumps to my mind is that it would be set. It's set in. It's a contract, so it'd be set in stone a little bit better. Even, even though this would likely be regularly occurring, particularly to successful programs, I'd imagine. Yeah. I can't see any reason why that wouldn't be. Right. Right. Michelle. Um, this is pretty irrelevant, but I just want to say it in case this document gets circulated, and I think it will be on our website, right? And people may take an interest in it. It looks like the high school has five clubs. No, I know. And that, that's <laughs> I can tell you why that's like that. There are like three times. No, I know. Yeah. Um, today, Bridget gave me some really good feedback from the first first draft. Okay. Um, and one of them was make sure that you put down like or, or it would be really available. good for the board to know these are all the things that are offered right now. Yeah. Um, so I was doing this at about four thirty this afternoon, and so so it was like quick off the top of my brain. And as I was doing it, I was thinking. I need to share this with the principals too, so yeah. that they can make sure that everything's on here. Yeah. Um, and that's why that happened. Okay, just check it. So yeah. before it gets circulated, we will make, make sure this that look that like piece. the lamest high school. Maybe <laughs> 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 that's not the image we want to. put No, maybe it's just before just because it's it was posted. Mind. You could yeah. Look yeah. That we'll up make sure that when that gets fixed, that that's that's the reason why. Because um, Bridget had such good feedback, and I was like, oh, I want to get that in before tonight, and then. It just didn't get totally in there. <laughs> I think I saw. So, I, this issue of the co-curricular versus the clubs, I, I did not fully understand the, the bureaucratic piece, for lack of a better word. But one of the things that I have been concerned about in terms of the after-school big picture at the middle school, and I think at the high school, though I'm less familiar with it there, is that it's very hard to understand the big picture and to understand how like the district is looking at it 30,000 feet. What are all the things that we're offering to kids and how are they coordinated? Is it the right mix of offerings? Is it the right mix of sports and STEM and drama and music? Do we have, you know, are we hitting all the bases? What does it look like in terms of scheduling? Can you be on the soccer team and be in the jazz band at the same time? Like, how are we looking at that? Are we funding all of these things correctly? Um, and how and many I, kids are in sports? How like, many kids are in these things? If like, two thirds of the students are in sports, maybe we only need after school stuff for one third of the kids. But if only one third of the kids are in sports, then our after school need might be a lot larger. Right. I would really prefer if we're, and I totally, I'm not sure this is enough money. I'm going to do that. I think, <laughs> I think we yep. should, kid, you know, five to 12 includes all of these things so that there's, you know, these issues about do we have a softball team and our kids going mountain biking are in the same conversation and the same person is looking at it. Um, and I, I, so, and I'll just finish where I was going with this, which is we already budgeted this money and we have repeatedly said, you know, I've heard Jim say it over and over again in Libby that we, we are committed to expanding this offer, this, these offerings. Um, but this is the money that has been used to budget what we currently have. And I think that it would be helpful to get a sense of the board of whether we're willing to commit to money out of the fund balance to expand this so that if so that we have the resources next year to start a really good program and if they are self-sustaining then we don't need to spend it and that would be great you know but if they're not that the district knows that the out. money is there um, and it's available so that we can fund it properly great because that that so that's exactly what I'd love to know too I would like to know uh, what I would be funding, and I don't know that yet. So in other words, uh, Libby has said this is the initial plan, <coughs> and um, so what do we need and how much more do we need in order to do it? And so some real numbers. Some real numbers yeah. would be what I would want to know before yeah. I said, sure, let's do it. I have nothing against yeah. it. I just want to know yeah. how much would it cost. This initial draft was to get the feelers out. Yeah, yes. but we do need some real numbers. You're right. Yeah, no, and I. And what is our timeline right now? Where are we in the process? So there's RFPs out. 
for the right. licensed child care piece. Right. So and we're going on site visits this week and next mm -hmm. to three of mm -hmm. the sites. We have an after school advisory committee on Friday to talk about the feedback we just got from the public forum. Um, we'd like the so the committee will be giving me a recommendation by the end of this month, right, Jim? Yes. Yes. <laughs> so we can make that decision around the licensed child care piece. Um, this piece um, would need to be in place by September. I mean, we'd need to have it by September. So, so I'm thinking that we'd want to, if we went this direction without new position, then we'd want to have that higher in July so they can get the ducks in a row that they need to get in a row. Yeah, and to you know, echo and I think build on what Bridget said, I mean, I don't have to get a sense of because I, I think is, you know, as we make these decisions, it's going to be, you know, probably a somewhat stepped process. Um, but I also think it's very important that we hit next year with, you know, the programming that kids need and the community wants. Um, and part of that might, for the administration's part, mean building some of this out before we go through our budget process. So uh, I think it would be good to have a sense of the board whether, you know, assuming it stays within a reasonable limit, there's support for, you know, if, if Libby says, you know, boy, if we added another 25,000, we could really get to where we need to be and have something to build on. That's the type of thing where she wouldn't come and, you know, put things in place and then have us say, well, you know, hold on. Hold off. Um, what are you looking for? Are you looking for, um, do we support what you've written and or are you looking for, gee, I wish I had another 25,000? I, I think we're looking for <coughs> support of the concept, including support that if we can, you know, if, if we can, you know, if this is something that makes sense and, uh, you know, 37,000 is all that's needed to do it in a way that makes sense starting next year and that'll make it stable for next year and then we can have a conversation the year after about whether we want to add to it. Um, or if after running some of the numbers, it's 37 plus a little bit, but I, I kind of want to get an endorsement of the concept. the concept within this number or, you know, perhaps more, but not, you know, a, a huge yeah. amount more. Cause, cause we, cause the administration just has not, you know, they've got some ballpark ideas, but they haven't sat down pen and paper with grant and really ran through all the scenarios to come up with what what it would look like to have the type of programming that kids need and that the community's going to want next year. Got it. Thank you. Steve, and then uh, Andrew. I think, I think there's so many fantastic <coughs> reasons to do this. The, the fifth, sixth, though, kind of sticks mm -hmm. a little here because the problem is as we move forward with licensing, we have to be really clear, I think, with what we want for those fifth, sixth under a licensing agreement, under, under agreement for yeah. licensing um, kids, because I think that it's a, you know, if we want to try to keep something of the quality <coughs> that we have, it can't shift towards that elementary model at all, really. Um, what the kids running around in the gym at, at Union is very different than what a sixth grader or a fifth grader is getting right now at the middle school. And I, I just want to be careful, because if we're going to split them and take, and and we're going to develop a vision for the enrichment then, and we're going to contract out the licensed kids, we've got to have definition about the five, six as we do that, I think. Yeah. We, can't, and, we can't put the cart before the horse on the Right. Yeah, yeah that. and that's something we definitely can keep looking at. And, and just to be clear, our current, our current situation handles 25 kids a day in a school of 350. So it's not the entire fifth and sixth grade that's yeah. being, being considered yeah. right now in any way, shape, or form. So we need to... So we want to make sure that, that that's one of my main goals is to increase opportunity for particularly our middle schoolers who need this type of work, need this type of group activity and structure. Yeah, and, and increase the number too. I mean, it would be great to get, you know, more like 40-ish you know, students at the middle school participate in that. And I think we do that by making, making exciting and accessible programming and building on the exciting and accessible programming. Andrew. So I have a couple questions. Um, the general uh, vision for the coordinator that Bridget espoused just before, I, I, I love that general approach to coordination. If somebody is coming in 
do we right now as a district have that information available? Is anybody keeping that information? How many kids are enrolled in, in what? Uh, is it on my, at my fingertips? Well, no. Could okay. we get that information? Yes. So that's something that somebody could put to, if they came in in July, I'm just thinking about the timeline of this, if they came in in July, that's something that they would, with, with your team's assistance, be able to... With time and yeah. <laughs> talking okay. to the right people, yes. It, it, would, it would be a process, it yes. like. that's fine. Yes. I, I was just curious to know where we are um, in terms of that. Uh, and then um, these, something that I think would be nice to have a little bit more um, elucidation on is how exactly how these programs might interact with this position and the programs that this position would be um, would be responsible for. Um, and I've heard which of these ideas. license programs. The license programs versus the enrichment interact. programs. How do they interact with each other? Yep. And um, if, yeah, I, would they be totally distinct? I, I don't I don't you know from a coordination perspective I think yeah. siloing is a real concern. Anyways, I'm curious to know how. And it's hard to answer that without having the licensed child care provider right. contracted yet. And when you're looking at these providers, are you, so does this change, if this proposal, would this change how you view these providers? In the RFP process? Yeah. No. So, okay. Some of their models, I guess my question is, would some of their models jive more than others with this type of approach? Maybe. Yeah, that's I don't have the, that. I could, I'd have to ask them specifically. <coughs> yeah. I don't want to speak to them because that's not a question that's been posed to the, yeah. to the bidder. So right. I would be making the assumptions based on what I've read. But now, here's my last question. In terms of what they've, uh, the, the proposal that they've responded to, is it based on more of a holistic enrichment and licensure combo, or is it based on just the licensure? Component? The licensure. Okay. And I think that's where the community piece comes in because you know, the enrichment part is important to a lot of community members and important to a lot of kids. So, um, and and we're going to need to have both in a really good place come mm -hmm. August twenty seventh or whenever school starts. And it's really important to the district. It's really important to the district well. too, yeah. and, and us to make sure that we have yeah. <laughs> ample opportunities for kids to build relationships. Sure. Um, I'm just concerned that that half-time employee is not going to be adequate. And I would definitely support um, drawing on our fund balance, which I think we got a memo on the fund balance, so I know there's money in there, <laughs> um, to expand that. Because this person is, you know, I know um, other, I guess I know Burlington School District has a full-time after-school program coordinator. They have, like, six or seven facilities, I think. So they have an in-district um, after-school program. Right. They don't contract out. Right. Yeah. So, but this still is dealing with two separate facilities that are really, you know, developmentally different kids, mm -hmm. eight different grades. And if we truly want over, somebody to vision and sustain and right. grow. So we may want either one full-time person who can oversee all of that or are a part time at each building who can oversee for each building. Yeah, but I, yeah. To me, it seems like this isn't gonna. This person's gonna be killing themselves and maybe not making it happen the way we want it to. Um, <laughs> more comments or questions? Mm -hmm. So I think this 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 has been helpful in terms of giving some guidance as you. Yes. Steer through. Yes, hard numbers. Look at a couple of different scenarios. Work through some more age ranges. Um, yeah, but people are generally on board with mm -hmm. this as a viable option and, and the possibility that it, it might cost a little more to do it right. I might not, but it might. I think for explaining to the community too, though, having that licensure component, like what we're proposing is the, this licensure provider would cover this, these grades, yeah. the, this area, this enrichment coordinator would cover this, and so that's very tangible for people. Yeah. Um, and they understand exactly what's going on. I think it's going to be really important to this. Right. Like we're providing childcare K six, and then we're providing enrichment five twelve, and there's. Or maybe even just a little, a little more bit. basic. Like these are the options your, your children have for after school care, and here are the yeah you know, the ways that here's yeah you can sign up and enroll. 
Because um, I think it's there are terms like licensure out there. Yeah. And I think yeah. there's also a demand for enrichment K-12. And so yeah. I think it's important yes. that the message from the district not be that enrichment starts at some seven. grade level, mm -hmm. whether it's seven, you know. Yeah. It's, and yeah. we, Ryan and I are talking about that the as well. The word childcare is not a great <coughs> word for what we're doing in our schools. Um, if we're doing it in our schools, it's expected that it that it has an educational value of some sort. Yep. And not that child care doesn't, but that, I mean, you can see it already in you know, second, third, fourth grades that these kids are looking for more, more advanced programs than they get right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, they, um, I think we, I think we want to make it more interesting and more interactive and more enriching, whether it falls under enrichment or licensing for all kids. Yeah, we, we have also heard a demand though that it be reliable yeah. and accessible and available in a exactly right. yeah. Yeah. Yep. Right. <laughs> yeah. right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. And so available to more people. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. I mean that's that's the basement upon which to build the house, but we need expand the availability, the reliability, the accessibility, Accessible. and yeah. then build and the quality. And then yep. quality and mm -hmm. Well, thank you all. I'll be working on this with the team, and we'll probably bring you another draft in the coming weeks. One, one final question. The state child care uh, subsidies that um, yep. are broken out in the chart that we were just going over in the, the last forum, um, those do not apply to enrichment. Is that correct? No, those are for the license okay, piece. Yeah. yeah, let me, could the next draft have maybe more of a summary on expenses and I just, all the numbers we've talked about tonight just seem so low to me to make this <laughs> successful. And I'm sure the after school committee has evaluated and reviewed and looked at things. I don't expect to go through all that again, but just maybe a better description of this is how much we've spent on, or community, community connections uses this much, or the why would do that much, or just more we of We can do that history. to the best of our ability. We, I can't, I might not be able to bring you hard numbers. Right, like I'm not expecting it to be like to the penny, but it just, $37,000 just doesn't seem like it can possibly pull off what we're trying to do and just maybe more justification for how we can make that happen. Mm -hmm. well, people are similarly. Paying. Right, but that's, how far is that going to go? I, 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 I don't know. That's I why seen I it. wanted right. to know too, right. It would be great along with the number of kids participating in sports programs to see our athletic program budget. Yeah. When you were that, talking earlier, I do know that our, our extracurricular budget is spent. What did Grant tell us? Two thirds of it is spent. About two thirds is spent sports. on sports. Oh, right. yeah. Of the of our extracurricular budget, two thirds is sports. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So are two thirds of our kids doing sports? That's and a great do question. Care, do kids pay a fee to do a sport? No. 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 So it seems like there's some equity stuff going on too amidst it's all of this. Thing. Thing. Yeah. You know that like it's free to do a sport after school, but then it's going to cost to do different yeah. different kind of activities. It's interesting. Well, and the the sports budgeting is kind of mysterious too because like the um, the Nordic team doesn't have transportation in its oh, budget, okay. and I don't know how that decision was made, but. There's two um, places. That's a, that's, <laughs> that's that's that gets strange. pretty pretty hectic every year trying to get kids to Nordic yeah. meets without a transportation budget. And you know, some sports the uniform budget is pretty the uniform, you know, for their outfit is pretty non existent. So how the budget is allocated among sports is And I and I like your question about the number too, because sometimes we've supported a sport that has hardly anybody in it. I'd rather pay for the uniforms for the people that, you know, we've got enough to feel the team, for example, right. kind of thing. And that's been iffy in the past. Keep sending those sports questions because I get a lot of them and I now have a monthly meeting with Matt Link because I was like, I need to meet. Like, I, this is coming up a lot, so I need to learn more about how processes are done and stuff. So know that, that I yeah. just I just started a monthly meeting with Matt out of need and um, because of questions that I get around sports. So send them my, you know, when you get them, send them my way for those kind of things. Like, I don't know that. Mm -hmm. I, I've never heard that before. So mm -hmm. that, that's just really good information as I'm continuing to learn all the nuggets and pieces of our district. But that our Nordic team doesn't have a... Transportation budget. Right, they have to drive. Or that people have different uniform budgets. You know, like that's, <laughs> that's strange to me, so... I think our Nordic <laughs> team also has one, one member. 
I don't know. My kid did it. Which three, I don't have seen right, it my, a my kid did yeah. it three years ago, and there were like 18 kids. I don't know, and they they were, had to get themselves to meets, but then parents didn't want kids driving other kids, and um, it was challenging. Yeah. I would love to see. I, I don't know what the status of the program is now. Yeah. I think it ebbs and yes and flows. Yeah. And this all feeds into the other conversation of what's going on at the middle school for sports, mm -hmm. and then how's the rec department dovetail into our sports program and create a contiguous a continuous um, path for kids who are doing baseball or basketball or whatever. Yeah. And how it's hard to coordinate all that, and it's it, we kind of. I'm not saying we're not doing a good job, I'm saying it's hard and that it has to be reevaluated at some regular level to determine, you know, we've got this big cohort of softball players coming through all of a sudden or, or frisbee, oops, that's not the word, disc players coming ultimate, through. Ultimate, ultimate, please do. Uh, <laughs> you know, I'm seeing them raising money for a club at the, the grocery store, but they're not really a sport, but they're the biggest group, of, or the, the, the girls bottom, volleyball team. Huge, right? And I was like, what? That's not a sport, I don't know what to call it. And, you know, it's so, I don't know how to do that, but it's, um, now we're talking about adding in the enrichment, which is sports often, it's mountain biking and hiking, and it's just not team sports. Actually, that's a good question, because in the past, haven't we not sort of competed with the rec department? If the rec department offered something, we didn't offer it, if they were willing to offer it. They're, I don't know how that works, but... It's not so much competition as continuity between the programs. Yeah. I don't think anyone's too worried about competition. It's more holes, I think. Well, I meant if the yeah. rec department offered it, we didn't, because yeah. we didn't have to, we offered something else, and so we should be cognizant of that when we're looking That's at like the big it's picture. It's only 5-6, right? Yeah. yeah. Rec department it's, ends at 6. It's so, so it, I mean, it's making me think a lot, as I'm listening, what's the district's role and and who is that person in the community you know like i i just don't know who like we can't take on everything right mm -hmm. and we can't yeah. offer everything to every kid right so but but what is our role what is our role here to ensure continuity or ensure opportunities and what um, should we offer and what should we offer yeah. for our opportunity and i like i like the question posed earlier is do we have an equal opportunity for multiple avenues for kids to pursue because um, I'm not sure we do um, and that's a really good question for us to look at what we can control but we can't control everything um, and there is a responsibility from a community community aspect to offer things to kids too I actually have a meeting with Bill Fraser next week to talk about some of these ideas yes. <laughs> so I think it's on somebody's mind over there at, at City Hall um, yeah anyway. yeah All right. All right. Um, are we ready for Let's try to Renee? get Renee up. Maybe I'll grow up with the screen. Yep. Okay. Oh, she's going to be on the big screen. She's going to be on the big screen. Yeah. Excuse me. Can I have a breakout? Do we have any teachers? Consensus yet about the Yes, I'm going to send around an email. Jesus Christ. So they started at 21 sections. Oh, oh, oh. Right. 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 I think the extended days will be uh, 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 the free and reduced Like it, in the high school. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't know yeah, in the high school. Uh, 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 well, in the middle school, there. In the middle school, is more similar to that. Uh, last year, we can make there's a set number of kids with the five or ten years. I think May 5th, May 1st, and 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 May 1
put you on the big screen here. It wasn't great. Okay. Was can it? I see everyone? Can you flip the screen down a little bit there so I can see? Oh yeah, because she's able to see. I see Jim. Hello. Is Michelle there too? Yep, she's way at the end. Hi, Renee. Hi, Renee. There's Steve over there. Oh, hi, Steve. He's being an outcast today. We won't let him on the table. Sorry, Okay, now I'm getting dizzy. We're just trying to get you on the big screen. For some. I'm sorry I don't have a better backdrop. It's very nice. See, we used to do that, and yeah. so we for it. Had an advanced Searching, yeah. waiting. But then we're just trying to get Oh, there you are. Okay. Hi, everyone. Kim, it's not. So, everyone, this is Renee DeFore, who is um, going to be our new high school principal. And Jim and I thought it was a good idea for you all to see her and meet her. <laughs> yeah. Online and ask any questions or um, anything you wish. Yeah, no, Hi, thank everyone. you. Hello, yeah, thank you, Renee, for um, taking some time to introduce yourself to the board. Um, you've met me, I guess all the board members, I guess, can do a quick introduction, but very excited to uh, have you coming on board. Um, and uh, I'll let you introduce yourself, but why don't the board members just give quick Two second introduction, and then Renee can introduce herself and uh, you know, give a little background, and then we can ask her whatever questions we have. Can you, you know hear me? Jim? Can you hear uh, me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Talk loud. You should teach your voices. Um, yeah, so I'm Jim Murphy. I'm the, the board chair. I've been on the board for a while. I'm uh, For my day job, I work for the National Wildlife Federation uh, doing legal and environmental advocacy. Tina. Hi, and I'm Tina Muncy, and I've been on the board a while, and I'm retired. <laughs> oh, I can't, well, I can't, I can't see her. <laughs> you can't see Tina? It's very important to see her. <laughs> Hi. Right. But I did used to uh, teach, and I was a principal once upon a time. Oh, lucky you. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Bridget Acey. Uh, we met at one of the meet and greets at the high school. Um, oh, nice hi. To see, nice to see can you again. See you. I can see you from a distance. <laughs> Great. Sorry, I've been on the board a few sorry. years, also a lawyer in my day job. Sure. Hey, Renee, I'm Ryan Zajac. I'm one of the Roxbury reps on the board. I've been in school for quite a while now. I was in Roxbury, the merger board, the new merge board, <laughs> lots of school board fun. And outside of my school board work, I spend time running the small library in Roxbury. Awesome. Nice to meet you, Ryan. Hi, Renee. I'm Lisa Frost, and I'm also a Roxbury representative. I did not have the pleasure of meeting you at your visit, um, and I am a freelance educator. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. She's making up the title of yeah. you guys. Yeah, more about that. That sounds so fancy. <laughs> Hi, Renee. I'm Andrew. I'm the newest member of the board, and for my day job, I'm the deputy state auditor, and I look forward to meeting you. <coughs> I look forward to meeting you too, Andrew. Andrew's super good at math. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good thing since he's the auditor. <laughs> I'm Michelle, who you already met. Um, I've, I have been on the board the longest, which is six years now. Um, and in the daytime, I am the director of a local watershed group. And I have two daughters who are both in high school. One is graduating, so you won't meet her. But the other will be a sophomore next year. Great. And then Steve is over here. Hi, Steve. Hey, I'm Steve Hinchin. Um, I've been, oh, I'm actually not a board member right now. <laughs> I uh, was reelected, but I forgot to go get sworn in at the clerk. So I'm sitting in the audience. Um, but uh, I have a couple of daughters who will be in middle school about the time you show up, and uh, I have a small business. Oh, great. Nice to meet you, Steve. Nice to meet all of you. We're missing one board member tonight, Becky. Who yes, who is, she um, was not feeling well, so she was unable to come. Ah, yes. I love seeing you. <laughs> so, um, okay. Do you want me to tell you a little bit about myself? Yeah, I'd love to. Yeah, so I've been in education um, right out of college. I started teaching in an alternative school when I was 21. So I grew up right outside of Portland, Oregon, in Vancouver, Washington. Um, 
after going to school at Southern New Hampshire University, which used to be New Hampshire College when I went there many, many years ago. Um, but when I finished up my college career, I moved back to my hometown, um, taught a few years uh, in Vancouver at an alternative high school, and then decided to kind of get out of the rain and go move to San Diego. And that's where I spent most of my high school or teaching career was in San Diego. Um, and then as I got my administrative credentials and my master's degree, I moved to El Segundo, um, was a principal there for four years, assistant principal for one, a principal for four. Um, there we became the first international baccalaureate school, actually the third public school in all of Los Angeles County um, to become international baccalaureate. Um, and then my, my father passed away in that time and my mom, I'm an only child, and my mom moved to the East Coast um, to be back with her immediate family. So I wanted to be closer to her, but I did not want to be living in Philly or New York City. Um, so I put my finger on the map and landed in Chicago, which was very similar in a lot of respects to where I grew up, um, kind of that Midwest culture. Um, and then I spent six years uh, in Lake Forest, uh, working at a, a high achieving middle school. Um, and now I'm here and I am so excited to come to Montpelier. Um, I have to tell you that when I saw the job description and then after I came there, I'm just even more excited about all the work that's being done there. I think one of the things that's been most important to me um, as I've gone through this whole process is not only to find a place where I feel like my strengths can be utilized, but also a place where I feel like I can learn from um, the work that's already been done. And that certainly is the case at Montpelier High School. Um, it just is being done there is phenomenal. I was really excited when I saw, initially saw the job description. I was so excited um, to see the work that was being done there as far as personalized learning plans, um, the flexible pathways to graduation, um, the work on equity and equality. There's just so many wonderful things happening there. And then to come there, and then see it all kind of come to life with the students and the staff and the parents and some of the board members that were there. Um, it was just a phenomenal experience. So I am really looking forward um, to coming there. And in fact, I'm coming there next weekend to find my place. So um, it's getting exciting and being very real. Uh, Do you have questions? Yeah, questions for Renee. <laughs> I would be very, I'm just interested, and I realize you're just getting into this, but interested to hear about the transition, you know, how the, how you interact with the, the outgoing principal and the team here as part of transitioning into the job. So Bridget asked about transition, could you hear her? Yeah. Do you want to start or do you want me to start? Um, yeah, I can start. Okay. Um, I, Mike and I have already been in contact with one another, so when I'm there, I'm, unfortunately I'm coming on the last day before spring break, which is an awesome time to show up and see how great things are um, at the school. So Mike and I will have a chance to just touch base then, but he is going to be around um, the following week, so he and I are going to have some time to connect um, that following Monday, just kind of one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and then I'm planning to be up there in June. So I'm planning to get a place probably June 1st and then kind of sporadically spend some time within the school, um, just kind of transitioning a little bit and kind of getting a feel for things um, with Mike, with the staff members and with the students um, as well. So um, looking forward to that. And then Libby, you can add whatever your thoughts are. <laughs> no, you were adding on. So Mike is, Mike is very open to making sure this transition is smooth as possible. So, um, so yeah, they've already connected. Um, we have plans for her to just walk around with him and really see the school through his eyes because it's unique, his perspective. Um, and then the beautiful thing also, I don't even know if you know this, but Mike's new position is right down the road. Um, and one of his roles is working with new principals to the position. Um, as men to mentors and things like that. So Renee, I don't even think we've talked about this yet, but principals who are new to buildings in Vermont, there's a state law that we, we get you a mentor and, and all of that. So Mike is now in charge of attaching mentors to new principals. <laughs> so, so we got it in there to get you a good one. Uh, um, oh, Mike be my mentor. Yeah, I know, right? I don't know if you want that. But, <laughs> but yeah, that's, so we have that plan already starting. And, and so McCraith is making very easy. Excellent. Excellent. Any other questions for, for Renee? Okay. Okay. 
nothing. <laughs> you know, something we didn't talk about, I'm looking at Ryan and Lisa right now, and something that we didn't talk a lot in the interview process is um, that the merger with Roxbury Village mm -hmm. is pretty, still pretty new. Um, when you come next week, maybe I'll take you through Roxbury. We'll blink and we'll be there. Um, and then, <laughs> but the students coming, they're kind of working their way through our system to be more and more at Montpelier High School. And I think just to put on your plate, um, that's a piece that you're going to have to really work at to see, to ensure that kids are being folded into um, mm -hmm. the high school, because it's different. They mm -hmm. went to different schools before. And um, mm -hmm. you know, like just the arrival of buses to the building will be mm -hmm. unique. <laughs> and kids yeah, getting yeah. off and coming to school. So there's going to be some challenges and some opportunities there. Yeah. And I think the beautiful thing about Montpelier High School, at least what I've, I've seen and heard and researched, is that there's, um, from what I understand, the students and staff are very welcoming um, to students, not to say that there isn't work that can be done, um, but there's um, such a presence of student voice, and I, I, just based off of my time there, I feel like um, students definitely will have a part to play in um, welcoming students from Roxbury. Um, into Montpelier High School and what that looks like and how we can make that better. Yeah. Yeah. And to just to add, in at freshman year, we also get a big influx of kids who have been going to private schools and kids mm -hmm. who are coming into our district from other districts because we have an exchange kind of a program, and a, yeah. we have a lottery. So, for instance, when my daughter who's a senior now when she was a freshman I think their eighth grade graduation was like 50 people and then when they started freshman year they had like 70 people that's mm -hmm. a big jump yeah. so I think you know folding Roxbury kids into that you're you're also getting a bunch of other new kids yeah. so yeah. Yeah. yeah and I think I think coming from other districts and coming from areas like Chicago and San Diego and whatnot you know I think conversations like that and looking at those numbers and does it make sense for us to do something and I don't know what's currently being done is there a freshman transition um, if not you know is that something that we can look at as as to how our students transition into into the high school um, just speaking of those private school students and students from Roxbury how can we get them more connected from day one it yeah, could definitely be stronger your eyes on the freshmen. we do have a transition program run by students mainly mm -hmm. who take control of it and yeah. like, around. It's, it's pretty cool to see because I saw it for the first time yeah. this year so it'd be nice to have other fresh eyes on it to say how can we how yeah. can we do that if we need to do it better how do we or it's pretty rocking right now great great any other questions for her thank you Renee yeah, I'm thank so you. Yeah. Of you virtually and yeah. soon we'll meet each other in person and I'm looking forward to it all right, thanks yeah. for taking your time tonight. We yeah, thank you. Thanks. Bye, guys. Good Bye. transition. And, oh, <laughs> <laughs> never mind. <laughs> I think that's it. Um, so just point of order, I will be sending around uh, pretty close to landing on some dates for the extended meetings and uh, retreat. Lightly extended will be 1st of May and 5th of June. Um, Going to reserve probably four thirty out, but we might not need that much time. Uh, and the week of the seventeenth is probably most likely for the retreat. Of that Wait, can you say all that again? I you said first of June and uh, the extended first of May, fifth of June. That pretty much count on that. Um, so what time line. might that start? First of May. Uh, we're going to book four thirty, um, but depending on how we line up. Uh, we may bring in, uh, you know, some sort of moderator, facilitator for a couple of those, or trainer, like for the communications part. We're going to reach out to the VSBA, uh, and then the other part we want to do is is a deep dive on equity, uh, depending on how broadly we do that, uh, and whether we bring in some sort of facilitator, moderator will depend on the timing. So, book 4:30. It may be, it may be five or 5:30, but just. Yeah, for scheduling purposes, book 430. And uh, that's and the first meeting of both May and June. First meeting of both May and June. It's going to start quite early. Yeah. And what are you eyeing for the retreat? Um, 
the week of the 17th. The June week. 17th. June 17th. So I just, I'll, I'll weigh in on that. There are some days there that I won't be able to. Oh, actually, maybe it might work out. It, it seems to be a good week for folks. And technically, it's not a retreat. It's an extended meeting. It's an just extended meeting. meeting. Yes. We can't it's have an extended We don't have retreats. So the week of the 17th, we we, if we have any preferences, uh, we, if we have uh, any preferences for days that week. Did you fill out the Google? Uh, I know that the Tuesday and Thursday uh, don't work for Olivia, so we're really talking about the 17th, 19th, or 21st. 17th, 19th. For a full day, right? For a full day. And I just wanted to comb through people's answers and see if there were any of those days that I don't recall any of them being off the charts, but um, I, before I picked a day, I wanted to finalize it. The ninth, well, yeah, the nineteenth we have a meeting, um, mm -hmm. so we're able to do it that day and no, not have that. Full no, not <laughs> well, I'll change the time of the meeting. Then a meeting. Be the meeting. Welcome to my world. Uh, huh? <laughs> it's your world, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm glad it's morning. Um, all right, I think we have a motion to adjourn and, and we will early or. I move to adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Great. Thanks, all.